Welcome everybody. Today I am very glad to have Ruby Blow, who is a friend of mine and also a clinician in Georgia. She's a licensed professional counselor in Georgia. She's also an approved clinical supervisor. She provides clinical supervision to a lot of counselors in Georgia. She's been practicing psychotherapy for about 23 years. Uh, she was an adjunct counselor or adjunct professor uh, for about 10 years in a counseling program. And today she's going to share with us insights around telesupervision, being able to provide supervision from a distance. Uh, let me show you her website. And on her website, you can find a lot of information on what she does. She also is very well known in the Atlanta area, area at least, uh, for her fantastic trainings. She's a phenomenal uh, trainer and instructor and supervisor. She has a Facebook page where she posts regularly. Um, and she, she has really helpful posts that I know a lot of clinicians greatly benefit from. Here's actually some links to her Facebook page, LinkedIn and Twitter. Uh, so you can read about her supervision, her clinical supervision services. Um, again, she's very well known, very much loved uh, by those that she serves. Um, she also provides coaching and consultation uh, to clinicians and then also counseling uh, to individuals. So Ruby, I am so glad to have you here. There's a lot of, um, there's a lot of, I actually, I actually personally receive a lot of calls, a fair amount from people looking for clinical supervision. And so there's a real need for it. Uh, there's yeah. a lot, you know, a lot of uh, supervisees or those that are working on full licensure really need a good clinician to work with, someone that they trust and someone that works within the niche that they want to work in. Right. They don't want to just have to pick the one that's in their geographical area. And then I know for clinical supervisors, it's really helpful. And this isn't anything like new, right? Right, right. Right. So well, supervisees have always reached out to supervisors when they're not like sitting in the same room together. Yeah. So maybe you can share how you got started and well, first, I just want to say thank you for that lovely introduction. When you went to my website, I thought, wow, I really love that website. And I guess I should. <laughs> it's I, a nice website. I have a big hand in putting it together. I do want to make one correction because I still get a lot of counseling referrals. If you're on my counseling page, what I actually do is I refer to other counselors now. I okay. stopped taking new counseling clients about six years ago. And, you know, a lot of people would open up a group practice and take those cases anyway. But I love to provide supervision and consultation. And so that's what I focus on, supervision, uh -huh. consultation, and training. And I really also, this tail end of what you were saying about people looking for a supervisor and they really want a supervisor in their niche. And I think this is such an important concept for people out there who are supervising to think about supervision itself is a niche. Mm. A person who is looking for a supervisor who maybe they want to learn something specific like EMDR or DBT, they absolutely are probably going to need to have an adjunct supervisor or consultant even who specializes in those areas that can help them get those certifications. Or let's say they want to be a play therapist or they want to get an addiction counseling certification. When it really comes down to becoming a licensed counselor or a, a licensed clinical social worker or whatever the field of practice is, it really, I think it's helpful to find a supervisor whose specialty is supervision. Because what a supervisor is providing is they're providing entree into the profession. And they're helping someone cultivate all of these very different skills and identities about entering a profession and a professional identity. And what can happen is when people are too focused on, do you know how to do X, Y, Z type of work? they actually lose the professional development piece that is so critical to becoming a, an effective professional who in the future, when they're independently licensed, can practice on their own. So yes, you want your supervisor to have experience. Um, they need to be an experienced clinician. They need to be knowledgeable. But more than anything, on top of that, they need to be uh, a person who specializes in supervision, as opposed to a clinician who said, ah, maybe I'll supervise because they're, they're totally different skill sets 
And when it comes to distance supervision, it also needs to be someone who actually believes in distance work as a medium and not someone who um, is kind of reluctantly providing distance supervision. Uh huh. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, I was in a clinical pastoral education program and I was a supervisor in training. And that process, that's, you know, after going through clinical pastoral, I mean, clinical pastoral uh, education for like two, three years, then you have an additional, it takes about five, six years just for the clinical supervision training itself. Right. So I can relate to that because it's, you know, five, six years of just learning about developing, professional develop, helping uh, clinicians develop. So it, it certainly is a specialty and a focus area. Not, it's not where, hey, I'm a good clinician, therefore I'll supervise and help others become good clinicians. Right. No, there's, there really is uh, a lot of uh, learning information about how to be an effective right. supervisor. So I'm glad you point that out. That's mm -hmm. something... Now, how would one, um, you know, find a supervisor that is, that truly does specialize in supervision? Um, well, certainly one of the things that's helped is having a supervision credential or being able to look and see who's gone through the trouble to even get a supervision credential. <laughs> gone through the trouble, that's right. <laughs> exactly, that's right. exactly. So, for example, one of the credentials I have is the approved clinical supervisor credential, which for counselors is one of our national credentials for supervision. But also in the state of Georgia, I have the certified professional counselor supervisor credential. So I think it, that's a, a place to start. That's not the end, but that is a place to start because then from there, typically you can find a listing and, and each state is different. There are some states that the, the licensing board uh, manages a, a clinical supervision credential and they have a process and a listing of approved supervisors. Um, there's professional associations that have listings, both state and national. So I think that's a good place to start because then from there you can go and see, okay, who has a website? Uh, who can I go learn more about? There's also, I think, good word of mouth talking to um, people who you went to graduate school with or people who are already in the profession. Who supervised you? Who would you recommend? Those are different ways to, to start, I think, of identifying a supervisor. Yeah, that's how I found mine is asking other people. You know, That's my top way. I try not to say that first, Ray, because it, mm -hmm. it feels so old school, but I yeah. feel like it's old school. It, it works. Yeah, word of mouth. Word of mouth is still the best way to find, you know, what, what's good. Yeah, yeah. Like, I've, I've had people locally reach out to me for clinical supervision, and I think they were just simply looking for a clinician who's been a clinician for a while, and that's right. in the area. Um, so, like, I think a lot of states don't actually have a special certification for clinical supervision. They just say, hey, listen, if you've been practicing for three, five years or more, then you can provide clinical supervision. And yeah, I, I would also say, too, it really depends on the profession. So, for example, marriage and family therapists, they have been on top of this since their inception. They have a credentialing that's just alongside the same track as their licensure. They have a process. Counseling, it's growing. We're growing state by state and by having a national credential. So I, I agree with you. We, we need to make this a little bit of less of an unknown area. I think it's kind of what you're getting to. People are just kind of, you know, Googling yeah. and they find you, which is great. And you're a great person to direct them mm -hmm. or to say, hey, this is what I think you should do. And who knows, maybe you'll decide to put that training you got into use. Someday. Yeah, I might, I might do that at some point. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so what, what drew you um, initially to providing supervision uh, remotely, like through video conferencing or phone? Yeah, I would say for me, it was just a natural progression. And uh, it really started when I was an adjunct faculty uh, in a counseling program. And so pe so that people won't think I'm being mysterious, I was an adjunct faculty member at Argosy University in Atlanta, which sadly doesn't exist anymore, but it was really a, a great program. And um, in and it's actually the program that I graduated from back in 1998. And um, I started there as a faculty member and I led in-person seminars for counseling students who were doing their internship. And then they needed someone to fill in for an online section. And they said, hey, we've got these internship students. One is in Alaska, one is in Savannah. 
you know, they were, they were in different places and they are going to do this online seminar. Would you be interested? And I thought, okay, I don't know how this is going to work online, but I'll uh-huh. give it a try. And it was really great. We had our own dedicated classroom online. We had a chat room. We had a teleconference line. We had a place to upload video or audio was what we, what we typically used um, where they could turn in assignments and write-ups of assessments and case notes. And we met weekly for a two and a half hour teleconference call where I would provide a supervision, uh, additional supervision regarding their internship. And Uh it was really a great entry point to recognizing, wow, everything that I'm doing in person, I can do at a distance. And it also creates a different type of, um, I guess, connectivity because you have to work to make that connection happen a little bit more. Uh Uh-huh. Yeah. So that's how I got started in general. Um, Right. And then it kind of shifted from there into what I do in my private practice as a, as a supervisor. Yeah. And how does that work um, currently? Yeah. Yeah. So I think the, having the teleconference experience as an instructor gave me the confidence to go, Oh, you know what? I could do this in my practice as well. And I started out with a teleconference line initially, but thankfully technology changes so rapidly that video conferencing came up pretty quickly behind that. And I was meeting with, um, I would have anywhere from 25 to 35 supervisees at a time because most of my practice is full-time supervision or consultation. And I would meet with people in supervision groups. It was, I was meeting with them in person, but some of you and people will get a laugh out of this when they see this, Ray, but you know, in Atlanta, when we get snow, Atlanta shuts down. Right. Okay? Yeah. Right. We had an ice storm one year and people were stranded on the highway for hours, et cetera. Well, wow. um, I, when those start, things started to happen, I realized I need a way to continue to do my work even when we have inclement weather, even when something goes on, it makes it difficult for us to all gather at my office. And yeah. that's when I started using um, video conferencing to hold my supervision meetings. And I really only used it when there was inclement weather. We would have these big thunderstorm warnings or we would have ice or snowstorms. And that's how I started using it. So my yeah. supervisees had a mixture of meeting with me in person and then video conference on occasion. Uh-huh. And then I wound up switching fully to video conference um, as a modality after I started having some health challenges and I needed to be working from home more and not trying to drive to the office and sit in traffic and, you know, just all the stressors that have to do with trying to get somewhere in a, in a big city that's being overgrown, right? And so I started right. working from home and it just became a natural progression. My supervisees were already used to video conference because we used it when there was inclement weather. And it really was a lifesaver in the sense that I was able to continue to work at a time where so many other things were competing for my time and attention, including doctor's appointments and family stuff. And it just became a way for me to keep my professional identity and do the work that I love. Ah, okay. Yeah. And how did it work out for your supervisees? How did they experience that transition? Or, you know, or people that call you and they don't know that you provide, I assume people contact you. They don't know that you provide telesupervision. They just know that you provide clinical supervision. And then you probably have to tell them, hey, well, it's actually through telesupervision. You're, you're so smart, Ray. That's one of the things I've always liked about you. You're so good. <laughs> such good insight. That's right. Because I've always been like in person, the mm-hmm. new people that contact me, they don't know that I'm only doing telesupervision now. And, and some of, for some of them at first, they're like, mm, that's, I didn't know that. I'm not sure if that's what I want. So I give them space to explore it. I offer them uh, individual introductory meeting, which I do via a video conference um, uh-huh. so they can get a feel for it. So they can see, hey, you're, we're having a real exchange in this medium right. that's just yeah. as real as anything that happens in person. And so for some people, that's enough for them to get over that hump. And I'm finding that depending on the age um, of supervisees, many of them, they prefer to do things via, um, a, you know, a, a tele medium anyway, a distance medium anyway, because that's a lot of what they're already doing in their lives. So, but my existing supervisees, um, they, I think at first, uh, because they had already been doing some distance work with me in inclement weather, it was like, okay, we'll try this. I think they thought we're going to go back to meeting in person. 
But the more I re recognize the value of it, the people not having to be late because of traffic, people yeah. being able to stay in their office after work and do their uh, video conference meeting and, uh, you know, just being able to come into my home office to work. It was not just convenient for me. I was noticing yeah. it was convenient for the people I was serving. And mm -hmm. so they, I think they've adjusted pretty well. I still have an option for them in terms of um, if someone really wants to meet with me in person, um, I'm going to be, I, I'm, I'm closing actually my physical office. This is how committed I am to it. I've had a physical office for 20 plus years. I'm closing that September 2019 because uh, I'm literally only there two afternoons per month. And that's I'm like, what I did. <laughs> I'm like, why? Why am I doing that? That's no I, I had the I'm same working. situation. Yeah, so um, they, I think they've adjusted fine. And to be quite honest with you, I've recognized that there's something for everyone. If it's not the right medium for them and they have options, I'm open to supporting them and finding something else. But I'm also finding that there are people where this has been a great fit for them. Uh, have you gotten feedback from your supervisees about that? About you know, I, I actually think that's a great question. I should get some more formalized feedback from them. I do have a process in supervision. I think it's beneficial not just for me to assess them, but them to also assess me and to give mm -hmm. me feedback. And I haven't incorporated this question about to um, tell a supervision into that process. So mm -hmm. you're, again, you're making me think, I, I think I should give them an option because I have so many supervisees, I do have a way for them to be able to give me uh, feedback potentially more anonymously. Whereas uh -huh. if you have a smaller supervision practice, I think you have to be, um, you wanna be open to getting feedback to, from supervisees, but as a supervision principal, you don't want your supervisees to feel like they're in a situation where they're giving you feedback where if you feel right. negatively or bad about it, that you could harshly judge them. Sure. So what, part of what I try to do is I try to notice what could I improve upon? Like, uh, and so I try to notice what are the barriers we're having in supervision. For example, today, I noticed I have this one new supervisee, meaning uh, she's, I've just had her for like a month and a half. She's not showing up for our video conference meetings. I'm sending her the links. She signed up for, signs up for these meetings. She doesn't show up. So today I messaged her and I said, hey, are you getting these? I messaged her via her phone as opposed to via email. I sent her like a text and I said, um, are you getting these, these video links that I'm sending you? Yeah. And she goes, oh no, I'm using a different email now. Oh. I haven't been getting these links. So I'm thinking, well, no wonder she's not showing up. Yeah, through, right. right. So if I had sent her a message via the email, I've been trying to communicate with her. She probably would not have seen it. Right. She must have lost track of that. That's how she was going to join these groups. So the, yeah. I'm, I'm always trying to problem solve. Like Just like in person, if someone's not showing up, you reach out to them. Maybe not immediately, depending on your theoretical yeah. model. Um, but I do. I give people space to figure out, hey, do I want to continue to do this? Then I reach out to them. And yeah. so how you do that electronically will depend on what are your different modes of contact you have for this person. Um, I'm using uh, a, doc, a, a system to manage my supervision agreements and forms electronically. I used to do all that stuff in person. Right. It's, uh, so I'm finding that there are a lot of ways to do everything I want to do online. Uh, yeah. But for the occasional person who wants to meet in person, say to have me review their licensing forms in person, I still have those two afternoons a month that I'll be at a colleague's office to, you know, for any I old see. schoolers who are like, you need to see, yeah. you need to handle, you need to handle my paper. Right. <laughs> I don't want you to just look at it on the screen. I want you to handle it. For them, okay. I will be creating a space to do that. Person. <laughs> but, I, but I can see how that can easily also be done online. Yeah. Yeah, certainly. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it's good that you're going electronic because especially when people aren't coming into your office, they need a way to do those things. And right. it's just so efficient and effective and clean and organized. Doing yes, it is. Yeah, mm -hmm. so you do a lot of group supervision. Yes. And um, I used to do some group work. And one thing I noticed with group work is the nonverbals were very important because if someone was sharing something in a group and the group was silent, you can see on the expressions on their face them responding to what you're saying. But when you're on a phone line, you can't see anybody. So you might feel abandoned when no one's responding to what you're sharing. Or in a group situation, people might respond to wait, respond non-verbally in ways to people that are sharing that really needs to be addressed. Um, but over the phone, you wouldn't see it. So I wonder, do you like? Have you? It sounds like you've done both. 
It sounds yes. like you've done supervision, just audio and video. Mm -hmm. And how have you experienced this, like the benefits and drawbacks of the two modalities? Yes. Of course, phone is very convenient. Yeah. Um, I mean, this is a great question. And again, I think it's a, it's a solution that's the same solution I would use in person when I'm running groups. Mm -hmm. uh, as a supervisor, part of my role is to facilitate the process. Uh -huh. And so this is really a facilitation matter. If someone is kind of disengaged with their supervisees, I actually ask them to engage. And I don't do it in a way where they're necessarily feeling called out. Typically, what I will do is I will sum up what that person just said. For example, I just had a group today mm -hmm. and uh, we are dealing. we were dealing with a career or professional development matter. And I kind of was wrapped up with that supervisee, but I wanted them to get peer feedback because what I know as a supervisor is my experience in the career is so far ahead of theirs that a lot of times I can say something and it has value, but it almost has more value if they hear it from their peers. Mm -hmm. So I will often give some kind of career or professional or ethical feedback, and then I will summarize some of what just happened and, but I'll call the names of the other peers and the, the supervisees in the group before I do that to make sure they're listening. So whether it's via phone or video conference where I can actually see what they're doing, I'll say, you know, hey, Bill, hey, Ann, I noticed that Natasha was just talking about such and such and such, and I shared this. It'd be great to get your feedback, whether it's support, advice, something from your own experience, and I will actually list to them the type of engagements Oh, yeah, um, sure. That they could do so that they're not thinking that this is optional. You're gonna yeah. So whether whether audio or video and audio combined, uh, you facilitate actively facilitate absolutely uh, engagement. Um, have you noticed? Has it uh, has it been a drawback for you just having the audio not being able to have the visual cues in the group setting? You know, it's interesting. Audio, I, mostly now I do video, but sometimes on the video, some some of the supervisees will just be on audio form. Right. For, for whatever Yeah, reason. like like now, you can't see me. Yes, but, yes, you know, right. Yeah, and, yeah. and so, like, for example, when I do mine, actually, let me do mine, too, so you can see what mine looks like. So when I go to stop video, you see a lovely picture of my face there. I, I do, uh, oh, did you no, see I, on, on this, I, on this, I don't for some reason. Oh, okay. So the other people on the video, they might be able to see it, but it was just a, a picture of my face yeah. so that when people are not seeing me in video, they can see my face. Sure. Right. And so, um, so I sometimes have a mixture of people who are on the video conference or they might just be only on the audio function. I prefer for folks, if we're doing video for us to all be video if possible, but I will take them as they come. Because right. sometimes people, okay. for whatever reason, they, maybe they might be eating dinner, which, you know, some people yeah. would be sticklers and say, I don't want people eating during supervision. I'm okay with that. I want people to have their basic needs met. Yeah. And I know how challenging it is to be a therapist and have been back-to-back -back sessions. Yeah. And now you're staying for your evening supervision group and you're hungry. If right. you would rather not see people, people have people see you showing food in your sure. face and stay on audio. But to answer your question, um, I think that there, the mediums are different and what I experience in them is different. So if I'm doing something where we're all via phone, um, I'm much more inclined towards calling on each person to share. Mm -hmm. One person might be sharing something about a case and then I'll say, okay, I want to hear from each person and we're going to go in this order. So I'll actually give them a lot more instruction with mm -hmm. regard to how I want them to engage. So one, each person will say their name, um, this is Nikki or this is Ann, or this is Bill, and mm -hmm. I'll have them share, make sure you share your name before you talk. So each person is aware of who it is. Um, uh, yep. If I'm yep. on video conference, I it's, interestingly enough, I feel like video is almost sometimes more challenging than just audio because you can actually see if someone is bored or see if someone is Yeah, I know, not. right, yeah. And so it's like, I'd almost rather not see that you're like, acting like you're not engaged. Yeah, that was going to be my next question for you. Because there's something called the disinhibition effect, which is people have less consideration of the other person's thoughts and feelings on the other side when communicating electronically. Like if, I, if, we, were face, if we were sitting six feet away from each other, 
I wouldn't be going like this. But on video or audio, I might be thinking, ah, pff, she's not really there. She doesn't really notice. And I could just mm -hmm. be like this, where this would be very rude if we were sitting six feet away from each other. Yeah. So people have the tendency to not be fully professional and so forth sometimes through the use of tech, you know, communicating through the use of technology. It's where, I, like, how have you yeah. experienced that or dealt with that? I, I do. I think of it, um, I'm, I'm happy to hear how you describe that as disinhibition. Mm -hmm. That seems right. I think there's also another component to it, which is people are accustomed to multitasking when they're using yeah. the electronic medium. And so right. they will be doing other things. Yeah. And so I will, I do have in my supervision agreement, I have a separate section that just deals with the distance part of it uh -huh. and what the expectations are. And one of the things that I ask them to do is to not drive, um, to not, you know, for one, I don't want them to have an accident or something they're distracted. Yeah, yeah. But the other is that's such a distracting thing to be doing. You can't really pay attention. Um, right. So it's also just the, not a good practice if you were doing teletherapy. So you shouldn't do yeah. it in telesupervision. Um, it, like I said, I'm kind of okay with people eating just because I feel like, you know, yeah. Uh, that's a, just an important life function that sometimes people need to do. I allowed that in my in-person supervision as well. Yeah. Not everyone is the same. So I, I get that. Some people are very regimented and they're like, who is this lady talking about it's okay to eat in supervision? That's just yeah. me. I'm just kind of laid back like that. But um, if the person is like, kind of like what you're saying, it's really clear, like they're over here. I can tell they're, they're on not being considerate. Device. Right, right. They're on another device. They're, they're doing yeah. something else. Um, what I will do typically is I will call upon them. Yeah. That's my top way. Uh -huh. Other times what I will do is you can on my video conference, you can send a private message to someone sure. if you want. Yep. But then some of this has to do with what you have to come back to supervision theory. What's your approach as a supervisor? Right. And so because I'm always trying to manage the supervisory relationship, I try to reduce shame as a supervisor. Right. I try to get people to increase their own level of self-awareness. And through my dialogue or the way that I engage them, I try to remind them that they have something to offer. I'll even thank someone who was previously not being attentive and where I didn't say anything about their inattentive, but when they are attentive, I will thank them for their engagement. I will uh, tell them, I so appreciate how you, were, <laughs> how you were really supportive, right? I appreciate how you were really supportive of your peer. So I try to get them to do more of what I want them to do as opposed to focusing on what I don't want them to do. But if I notice them doing something that I think is detracting from the process of being in group, yeah. I will I will just engage them. Right. Because you know that there's going to be a parallel process between how they're responding to their peers and how they're going to respond to clients, right? Absolutely. There's yeah. that. And there's also recognizing they have something to offer. I find it for beginning counselors sure. or people who are, you know, joining the field, they are, sometimes they're thinking the right. supervisor is going to respond to that. I don't have a role here. Right. And I think it's important for them to recognize that they have expertise themselves. They have a role to play, that their input does matter. And so yeah. that's, a, that's, a, that's actually the number one it's you're, you're right. It is a, a, it is a parallel to how they might engage with clients, but the difference is, when they're with clients, typically it's one-on-one -on -one or even in group, yeah. they are specifically in a leadership role. That's now right. they're in a role where they don't necessarily feel like it's their place to lead and yeah. they they may have kind of lost track of how should I be here? Sure. So that's a big part of my role as supervisor to both keep them engaged in the process, but also to um, recognize that would they have something of value to offer? Right, right. Now, another a concern with group work and technology is recording. Yes. Uh, so, of course, if you had a group in your physical office sitting in the same room together, any one of them could easily record the session. Mm -hmm. uh, but they might be less likely to, or it might be a little bit more difficult to without being noticed. Um, so, yeah, that's the one risk with, um, with this kind of work. And uh, I suppose it's just reminders is, and yeah. being very clear about not to record you're right i mean that is a risk period i mean i'm hearing more and more about mm -hmm. therapists dealing with clients uh wanting to record or recording in sessions or recording mm -hmm. even after they've been told not to um yeah. and that happens in person or it could happen um at a distance yeah. um i i think that for me um 
I, I haven't personally run into it if, as a therapist or as a supervisor. That doesn't uh -huh. mean that there might not be, be people who would want to record. I actually mm -hmm. ran into it more as an instructor. If when I was like leading sure. a seminar class, uh, students may want to record me because they didn't want to take notes, things yeah. like that. Um, I haven't, I haven't experienced it as much personally as a supervisor or as a clinician. Yeah, yeah. And then um, one of the benefits of telesupervision is the supervisee either being able to record a clinical session to be reviewed with their supervisor or the supervisor looking in on a, uh, um, a session between the yes. supervisee and a client and then giving advice like, a, like the one-way mirror Mm -hmm. uh, situation where they used to have the earpiece, but now you can use a camera and just type back and forth. Uh, yeah. Wonder if you utilize those and, and what that's been like for you. So yeah, you bring up something really important. An important part of supervision itself is the evaluative piece. The difference between being a supervisor and say being a consultant um, or just talking to someone about cases is that right. the supervisor is going to evaluate. So yeah. um technology has always been a part, uh, almost always been a part of the evaluative process, but mm. this just out opens more avenues of how you could do that. Uh -huh. And um, and kind of in our free meeting when we were talking about this, I just had a revelation that would really excited me that I hadn't yeah. thought about before that uh, how I could observe. I, I typically have still gone out into the field to observe supervisees or I have them do a, a recording and then I listen to the recording with them um, via our video conference. Um, but I uh -huh. like the idea of being able to live in real time to not have to go out to the place and just of course use already a video conference link as long as you have the per permission of the subjects, right? So right. that's an important part with supervision is the client or clients need to give permission for that observation. Right. Um, and that needs to be a uh, written consent. And so I yeah. collect that from my supervisees in advance, but I do. I actually plan to give that a test run, the part of more the yeah. live, what I call live supervision, where right. uh, the person is in the session and I'm essentially in the session with them, but, right. but well, I would be there virtually. Right. Right. Um, yep. I think that could be a great um, resource for, for clients and for supervisees. I, I would imagine that it's, you know, the best way to truly evaluate someone. Absolutely. Life. I think so. Yeah. I mean, there is always the effect of that people sometimes behave differently when someone is yeah. watching. Yeah. Um, yeah. But, uh, but over time, if you've done it a few times, I think they might relax a little bit uh -huh. or in the session, they might kind of, I'm not forget that you're there, but they are going to fall into whatever it's their normal pattern. Right. Um, and so, yeah, I do think live supervision is the most ideal. Mm -hmm. um, at the same time, sometimes clients behave differently when, um, when they know someone is watching, but they too also will, typically they will relax um, and get into whatever their normal cadence is. And also too, sometimes it depends on the age of the client. I find that sometimes um, younger clients, um, they're typically more self-conscious at first and then eventually they just go back to their old mode. Um, whereas wow. sometimes um, older clients are, they might keep the same level of caution the whole time. and. Um, those sometimes those are clients that you just shouldn't record or just shouldn't do that with. That's the, the gift of it with supervision. You don't have to use a recording to evaluate every case. You're evaluating your supervisee and the supervisee is the same whether yeah. whoever the client is. So you're evaluating their skill set yeah. and that's the most important part to observe. So you found it beneficial to do the audio recordings and review that with your supervisees? Yes, typically that's what I do because it, yeah. in a way it's less obstructive usually for clients they uh -huh. the recording is there it's just they're aware of it they sign the consent then it's like they're just talking to right. the therapist yeah but i do i have enjoyed live supervision for some family cases and for some group therapy uh -huh. i find that because there's multiple people talking those are better for live observation uh, right that and makes so sense that's yep. where yeah, that's where I yeah. think I want to try your idea that you were talking about. Yeah, and some some supervisors find it helpful, the, the live supervision uh, with video conferencing, they find it helpful because they can give advice to the supervisee and the supervisee could immediately implement it and try it out. 
rather than having a recording and saying, hey, you know what, back at this time spot, yeah, maybe you could have tried this, but they might not get that opportunity again. Whereas well, with the live, yeah. they could immediately try it out and see. I, I right. was going to say, even a step further, because mm -hmm. when I do live observation supervision, what I typically try to do is observe for part of the session. I will let the client and the therapist know at some point I may join in. Is that okay? Uh -huh. I get permission or you know, really I'm telling them, but I get permission. <laughs> and, yeah. um, They're not going to say no. <laughs> right. right. You know, usually depending on how confident you yeah. are and, and show your competency there, they're excited. Most clients are like two therapists for the price of one. Great. Yeah. You sure. know, why not? Um, I've even had some of my supervisees clients say, ask your supervisor what she thinks about <laughs> such and such. So they, yeah, they, yeah. they kind of like the idea that their therapist has support. But uh, sometimes what I will do is I will participate on the therapist side because think about uh -huh. it like this. If you're in a video conference, you chat, you type a message to the therapist to get them to try something. They may be looking at reading, not really understanding sure. what you're meaning. But if I've already gotten kind of permission to say, hey, you know what, I may join you guys. Now I can model. Yeah. And it's often not since someone's internship that they've had someone model a therapy for them and or intervention for them or strategy for right. them. So I, I would typically like to do when I'm doing a live observation, I may join sure, on the therapist do, side. Yeah, so in that way, the, the supervisee and the client would both see the monitor. They'd both see you on the screen. Right. Um, right. Which would be, yeah, I, I like that idea a lot. It's very yeah. personable. Mm -hmm. um, I would think you would set people at ease. Right. Yeah. It's like, who is this mystery person? No, you can yeah. see me. And, that's right. Um, now and I'm, a friendly, yeah. I'm a friendly lady. I'm right here. That's right. And so I think that could, I think that could make a difference. So actually, I'll give you some feedback when I do yes. that and I let you know how that goes. Yeah, I would love to hear that. Mm -hmm. So uh, just for the last couple minutes, um, any advice uh, for people that are looking to provide clinical supervision in terms of um, how to prepare, what to look out for, any setup type stuff that you would advise people on? Yeah, so um, my first thought when I heard that question was how my advice would be different for people at different stages of development. Uh -huh. so, so, so for example, uh, depending on if you ha already have experience as a supervisor and you've already been supervising, mm -hmm. um, it, it might be a matter of applying those strategies that you used in in-person supervision at distance and picking your technology, picking your resources, maybe mm -hmm. um, consulting um, and getting some support or joining a peer support of, with supervisors. It mm -hmm. might be picking out your video conference. For me, because I have a lot of supervisees, I needed to also have a platform to organize my meetings so they can sign up for groups. Uh -huh. um, and so that allows them some movement. If they can't attend a meeting, they can sign up for another meeting. Yeah. Um, I actually use a program called Group Zones for that. Uh -huh. And I've been giving them so much feedback that they, they sent me an Amazon gift card to thank me for their feedback to improve nice. their platform. So, um, so it's really, if, it's, if you're an experienced person, it's a matter of how can you transition what you're already doing and finding the resources that will work for you. I would say if you're a newer supervisor, even if you've been a clinician for a while, but you're a newer supervisor, it's really more a matter of not finding yourself in isolation as a supervisor. For example, I have a, a, um, a consultation group of other supervisors that I meet with. We're at, we do similar work. Um, we provide support to one another. I think that's important to have at all stages, even if you're experienced. Right. But, you know, it's just like if someone wants to do teletherapy, it's a, yeah. and they're a new therapist as opposed to a therapist who's been practicing for five years. Yeah. The advice you would give them would be different because it's also about cultivating that skill as a therapist. So right. I would say the main thing for everyone is uh, make sure you're looking at resources. Like, you know, you're a great resource, you know, mm -hmm. looking at uh, supervision circles, where you are, who are the other supervisors on that listing of approved supervisors or certified supervisors. What are your professional local or national organizations doing to gather supervisors together? Don't, don't do that work in isolation would be my uh -huh. first step, whether it's going to be live, in person, old school, or if it's going to be more new school and you're doing a video conferencing. Make yes. sure that you have other supervisors to talk to or experience 
have a, a, a supervisory approach, just like you have a therapeutic approach. Know how you're going to respond to supervisees as they're trying to learn and grow. It really is about having that skills as a supervisor and then transferring those skills into this modality. Right. Yeah, that makes sense. Yep. And so, you know, I asked you your advice, you know, suggestions to people starting to do tele-supervision. And what you focused on was more so about doing clinical supervision. And what that points out to me, and hopefully it points out to all listeners, is that adding on the technology is really not a big deal. Right. It's a very small piece of the puzzle. Uh, there's not much difference between this and if you and I were sitting in the same room together, Ruby, other than you and I would probably go out and get coffee afterwards or something. Yeah, that's true. That's true. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, that's exactly right, Ray. It's it's really important that the person identifies having the skill sets to do it, but also the support system. I noticed that when people are doing distance work, it does allow you to be more on your own doing the work. And I think it's important to build community. Some of that community might be online. Um, Some of that community might be in person. I do have online communities I'm a part of that are other clinicians and supervisors. And so I think not being in isolation is one of the keys when you're doing distance work. Yeah, and one one piece of that in terms of not being in isolation, if you are doing telesupervision work and you're in a peer supervisory group, um, to get on video together. Because yes. a lot of people think that they're good at presenting through a camera and they're not like, cause the lighting, the setup, that their, right. their microphone might be, might stink, you know? So yeah. like, um, like allowing another supervisor to be a kind of, uh, trial cl- a trial right. supervisee the practice. Yeah. To give you feedback and, and to reflect back to, you you know, their experience as the test supervisee and so forth. Yeah, I think that's a great idea. I actually have, my group that I meet with, we have actually at times met on, on video conference. Uh, okay. Um, yeah. They're old school. They prefer to meet in person, but yeah. uh, sometimes it's worked better. One of my members, she had a, a accident. She didn't want to mm-hmm. get on the roads just yeah. yet. It worked out for us to meet via video conference. So uh, I found great. sometimes people make that bridge to using the technology because there's a barrier to doing it the old way. And then they realize, oh, this is actually kind of easy. I yeah. mean, that's not to say it doesn't require some work, but it's not, it's not a barrier to effectiveness as, as, as some people initially view it as. Sure. Yeah. Well, Ruby, thank you very, very much for your time. I know uh, thank a lot you for of having me. and also supervisees looking for supervisors have benefited from this in terms of how to identify a supervisor that'd be a fit. And then if you're doing it, you know, um, things. And I, you know, I want to add one more thing real quick, Ray. Mm-hmm. There are, you mentioned earlier, I supervise a lot of people in Georgia. I have supervisees now who are, some of them are moving out of state and they're right. able to continue with supervision with me because we're doing supervision at a distance. Uh, yeah. And as long as their state allows for the type of credential I have, which is a national supervisor credential, they're allowed to do it. Yeah. So finding a supervisor also involves knowing the supervision rules in your state it yeah. may allow you to, if there's not a supervisor in your area, to find someone at a distance. So I just wanted to throw right. that in because we don't have the yeah. barriers online that you have sure. in person. And if you're not looking for supervision specifically for um, to be a- applied towards getting fully licensed, but you just want clinical supervision, then you don't have to worry about you know where this. That's true. Is. That's true. And and yeah. So there's those are there are different reasons why people are seeking. Yeah, sure. Supervision. That's true. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. But I want to thank you for having me. Yeah. Our, neither one of us have a super easy schedule, so I appreciate how we were able to navigate this yeah. together. So that's thank right. you for having me. Yes. Thank you so much.